To those of you who think too big to fail is a thing, I'm here to tell you it's not. But for those of you who embrace catastrophism and think that a dystopian Mad Max future is absolutely guaranteed, you're wrong too. Like, both of those views are extreme and not historically the norm. Okay, so here's here's a fallacy people often have. They think that history is a linear progression from, like, primitive to advanced. And that's just false. History doesn't work that way at all. History goes, nee, 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 nee. forward, back, forward, back, up, down, collapse, right? Sometimes you go backwards. Sometimes you make quantum leap forwards. The only thing that we can be sure of up till now is that some part of us has always survived, right? Whatever bottlenecks, disasters, meteor impacts have happened, the thread of our line has been pretty damn lucky. We've survived for however many millions of years to this point. Now, that does not guarantee <laughs> or give us, in fact, any indication of how well we will continue into the future. Just because we have survived since the beginning of time doesn't mean we will survive till the end of time. But we can at least make the broad generalization that humanity is a lucky species so far. That's why I'm an optimist. I actually think we have some chance of going forward in potentially quite different forms, but forward nonetheless. I have children. They intend to have children. My best friends are having children. We're moving forward, people. I think there's an argument to be made. Now, I want to dispel two illusions, two biases that, that, that are, are very frequent. One is things always get better. No, it's just not true. For example, let's use the example of Roman pottery. As uh, Mr. Ford, Henry Ford, discovered, there are some advantages to uh, creating a specialized um, uh, kind of factory way of making things. The Roman Empire got very good at making vases. They figured out over just, you know, countless hours of experimentation how to get the best bang for buck. In other words, the strongest, using the least amount of materials, biggest volumes, fastest manufacturing, and ultimately what that did is it drove down the cost, right? Well, if the Romans could make significantly better pottery for cheaper than you could, you used Roman pottery. And, and so as the empire spread, Roman pottery just kind of took over all the markets. Uh, you know, north, south, east, west, Roman pottery spread. Why wouldn't it? It was the best available. You used it. And then what that meant is that local artisans just stopped practicing the art of throwing pots. Like they just stopped, like why would you do pots when cheap Roman pottery was coming into your market from outside that was better, right? So literally everybody forgot how to make pottery except the pottery specialists in Italy. And when Rome collapsed, it took 1,000 years in the historical record before we see any pottery even remotely as good as the Roman pottery before it. People forgot how to make it. And when that skill went away, we had to relearn it. And it took a while, right? Technology is not linear. You've heard of these matter out of place, moop kind of situations, like um, <clears throat> this barnacle encrusted gear machine. It is literally an analog computer built pre-ancient Greece, I think. We don't know who built it, where it came from, but it shows us that there was massively advanced technology in the past that got lost and that we have had to recreate in modern times, right? This happens again and again and again in modern history that we know about, so it must have happened in ancient history that we don't know about. For example, the 
amazing archaeological dig sites uh, in Turkey, Golbekli Tepe. Um, basically, we are discovering and have just discovered in the last decade that there is a massive community of temples and villages that were at the hybrid of hunter-gatherer early agricultural communities in a way that we don't understand at all, in a way that completely defies the linear nature of, we thought, hunter-gatherers, then agriculture, then cities, then city-states, then temples. We're wrong about that. We're completely wrong about that. Temples are at the beginning, mind blown. And, and then agriculture is quite a bit later, and it was kind of adopted helter-skelter, right? We're, we're learning that our ideas about the past are wrong, and why would they be right? There's so little evidence available, right? We're having to build up our knowledge from biases of the present uh, that keep keep getting broken by the evidence, right? So other examples of how we gain and lose technology. <laughs> okay, so people figured out, ancient Egyptians figured out people. Ancient Egyptians, so thousands of years ago, they figured out how to measure differences in certain shadows that allowed them to calculate the spherical volume and circumference of the Earth using math. Now, if at a certain moment, each stick casts no shadow, no shadow at all, that's perfectly easy to understand, provided the Earth is flat. If the shadow at Syene is at a certain length, and the shadow at Alexandria is the same length, that also makes sense on a flat Earth. But how could it be, Eratosthenes asked, that at the same instant there was no shadow at Syene and a very substantial shadow at Alexandria? The only answer was that the surface of the Earth is curved. Not only that, but the greater the curvature, the bigger the difference in the lengths of the shadows. The sun... This was understood by the ancients. Today, in modern times, arguably in a culture that is the most well-educated, most rich, most abundant culture of all time, the Flat Earth Society can boast a million members. And back then, not only did everyone know the Earth was a sphere, high school graduates could calculate that to within a tolerance that is equivalent to modern satellite GPSs. Like, right? This is what I'm saying. It's not linear. It's cyclical. It's spiral, like the DNA. Astrology is a spiral model that also reveals these patterns in it, right? It's waves. Things go up, things go down. Things go up, things go down, right? Constant. This is true of the oceans. This is also true of human societies, of human ideas. Things flow in and out of importance and existence. What this means is that both extreme views of the future are probably wrong. That we are destined for a Mad Max collapse is true in regional examples, but as a species, so far, we've always made it through. But the too-big-to-fail crowd are also completely wrong because, so far, every major institution we know about has, in fact, gone into decline, if not fully disappeared. We have just rediscovered, for example using LIDAR shooting through the canopy of the Amazon jungle, that there was, in fact, as an explorer from Portugal in the, like, 1500s told us, I maybe have the date wrong, it might have even been 1400s, he wrote in his journal, he was an, on an exploration that went up the Amazon, and he basically describes a thriving civilization of tens of millions of people with cities all up and down the river, all connected trade routes, etc. Everybody thought he was a liar because a hundred years later, when the Spanish arrived, there was nothing even remotely like that. Well, guess what? 
the European diseases that the Portuguese guy dropped off on his first peaceful voyage of exploration, a hundred years later, by the time the next wave of Europeans arrived, had decimated and destroyed what we now know was there because we see it in the LIDAR. This evidence of these ancient structures that were just overcome by the jungle. The, have you seen the Honduran uh, lost city of the monkey god? Yes. Yes. So, yes. so good. Yeah. There's a like Ooh, full civilization yeah. in Honduras, like a bustling city that they found in LIDAR two or three years ago. There was probably a hundred million people in the Amazon, a full thriving culture that genetically goes way back and connects to the Aboriginal genetics on Australia and the Indonesian line. This is potentially a completely separate line of evolution, not out of Africa, but out of Indonesia into Amazonia, substantially older than we thought, 250,000 years ago, possibly. So, and then all this is brand new discovery, right? Within the last couple of years, we're just realizing, wow, reality is way different than we thought. So I guess what I'm concluding today in today's ramble is, I think there's a case to be made that we don't need to catastrophize and keep ourselves in a panicky fight or flight mode all the time like the media would like us to be. And I think we can look forward and say, you know, we can get to a solar punk semi-utopian future from this broken place if we really realistically plan for that and shoot forward for it optimistically. And it's going to look different, but we can make it through. And then on the flip side, the argument for those who are like just totally gung-ho techno-utopians who think too big to fail is real. I want to say, no, very big things collapse all the time. In fact, from a survivability standpoint, there reaches a certain point of size where size no longer helps you in resilience, but in fact works against you. So this is why we no longer have giants on the earth in many regards. For one reason, we probably killed them. But the other reason is that just, just genetically, this is why the Neanderthals had trouble. The larger your body gets, so it, for a while, it's an advantage, right? Because you're bigger than everybody, right? You're tougher, you're stronger. But then you get to a certain body size and the needs to fuel that body become so extreme that the, you then become vulnerable again and you actually can't maintain your structure because of its demands. And so then evolution kind of forces you down. This is why dwarfism, like the hobbit people so-called on the Isle of Java and the miniature uh, elephants and things like that on, that develop on islands, lack of resources, genetic evolution, the evolutionary pressures shrink everybody down to smaller bodies and body sizes. You're much more resilient then. I mean, the dinosaurs, partly, you know, they, their environment just changed very quickly. But massive size has problems in adaptability, which is why during this age of mammals, we have done so well and we're relatively moderately sized, right? So bigger is not always better. And of course I'm using the physical bodies, but also as a metaphor for cultures and organizations and societies and cities. At some point, size is a vulnerability. You know, you collectivize, you build a fort, you're better able to defend yourself. So size helps you until it's too big and then size works against you, right? It's always that. It's waves. It's a cycle model. It's spirals. So this too shall pass. Don't be too confident in your organizations and institutions. But we will survive and adapt and thrive as we always have is another way of looking at it. I guess. Am I arguing the middle path? Perhaps. Trying to offer hope in an age of catastrophe where things really are genuinely changing and there is a certain amount of earned anxiety in the space. I'm saying I think we can be more at peace and more confident and more enthusiastic about imagining a positive future but only if we let go of some of the 
unexamined prejudices and biases we have about the current status quo. <laughs> Aho, my friends.